So we will begin. I have um, an Advent prayer here. Um, we will skip the part. I wasn't going to like the Advent week, but I kept it in there in case you would like to use this service at home or at another time. So we will um, skip that portion. Um, is there anyone, after I read the opening, who would like to read the scripture from James when we get to that point? Thanks, Nancy. And then um, we'll go over the reflection. So let us begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear Lord, during this holy season of Advent, we are awaiting people. Since the coming of Christ goes on forever, he is always he who is to come in the world and in the church. There is always an Advent going on. <laughs> Be patient, therefore, beloved, until the coming of the Lord. The farmer waits for the precious crop from the earth, being patient with it until it receives the early and the late rains. You also must be patient. Strengthen your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Our reflection, Advent is a waiting time. We wait await the celebration of the birth of Jesus. We await Christ's second coming, but God waits for us too. God lives today, and so our first challenge is to bring Jesus to life in our own living, to become aware of his presence, the presence of the Spirit within us, prompting us, sustaining us, working through us, waiting for us. Anybody have any thoughts about that scripture or that reflection or about Advent? So much we think about Jesus coming at Christmas and Jesus coming the second coming. And I liked this perspective that it's not only us waiting, but God waiting for us. And the emphasis on that, it's the Holy Spirit. I've heard a lot about the Holy Spirit in Advent. So that was something new for me too, to think of um, the Holy Spirit within us prompting us and waiting for us. Going along with that Holy Spirit, um, we read with the children yesterday the story of Mary finds out that she's going to be the mother. Yes. And in that Gabriel scene, uh, the Spirit comes down upon her. So that so that is mentioned in that yes. the Spirit. When I think of Spirit, I usually think of Pentecost Sunday and some of the other. Right. There, the Holy Spirit was there at the very, very beginning. Right. That's a good point. The Good Shepherd has much to teach us. The it Good does. Shepherd program, doesn't it? It takes all our. And you know what? This is probably just me, but it's kind of like the month of December. It's almost like I do feel you're waiting. Something is coming, you know, yes. and it's Christmas, but they, I mean, you, know, it's, you just have that feeling, you know, that everything, you know, 
you're waiting for that to happen. Yeah. The waiting, the anticipation, and I like the emphasis here. Many times we heard the word patient and patience. That was a good reminder for me. I think also the word challenge is very pertinent to this month because we do have a lot of challenges with the holiday and we have to stop and think what our major priority is. Yes. And I think St. Teresa today had a lot of challenges like that. She went back to her convent and it was so secular and yes. she struggled with that. I think challenge is a good word to that, to describing of and thank you. That brings us right into our discussion today. <laughs> we'll continue. We'll use the intercessions and the closing prayer um, at the end of our discussion. So um, we have Saint Teresa of Avila. If we're taking the um, Spanish um, pronunciation there, but Saint Teresa of Avila. Um, loving God with your whole soul. I love that subtitle there, that description of her life and the reflections that we have. That if we can walk away from this discussion knowing more about loving God with our whole soul. I thought that was a wonderful perspective. And on page 24, they started with the scripture verse from 2 Corinthians. Examine yourselves to see whether you are holding to your faith. Do you not realize that Jesus Christ is in you? When we talk about challenges, here's one to realize. And certainly St. Teresa, St. Teresa that we're speaking of today talked about Jesus being in her soul. She gives us great detail of the description of her soul and Jesus residing in her soul. And that's interesting because I turned that heat off. <laughs> so <laughs> let's hope it doesn't get much louder than that. It's kind of noisy. Oh, so welcome. No problem. It's a little noisy out there, so. We'll see if that's going to kick on or I, I really don't know what else to do since I turned it off. Uh, maybe there's another furnace going. So yeah, maybe just a fan. Um, so tell me, what did you think about the life of St. Teresa of Avila as you read through this? certainly grew up in much comfort. Yeah. And, and she enjoyed that. She admits that she enjoyed those comforts very much. That it was not easy to turn away from those. Right. She had a hard time leaving her home and her comforts yeah. in her home. Well, it was interesting how many times she mentioned, or the author mentioned, that she sought the approval of others. That that was important to her what other people were thinking. I thought that was very interesting because that has been something that has been very hard to leave behind, just the same as the dress and the appearance and the luxury and the comfort and just everything. To do kind of an about face and to not, to, to, to stand outside and to be criticized by the sisters that she lived with when she tried to reform her when she reformed her. Jesus 
sometimes a challenge to get to. Yes, but what a challenge for us, right, to remember. With those thoughts, I remembered Mary Ellen's comment last month with St. Teresa of Lisieux, saying, I wonder what the other sisters thought <laughs> when St. Teresa of Lisieux came in and said, we need to change some things in this order here. That, and here's Teresa of Avila doing the same thing, right? Saying, uh, there's a little too much luxury here, a little too much comfort, a little too much space. So I thought here is the same response that Mary Ellen pointed out last month that um, to take, and that, that's not easy. Um, to be the new person coming in and to point out what needs to change. I was impressed just with the fact that it appears uh, that I wasn't aware of the more uh, affluent uh, of, this, of the sisters and of the yeah. people who went, which is so, from, grow, from having nuns uh, teach me yes. in school, uh, and they certainly were affluent, and they didn't live in affluent, so that was kind of a, a new uh, world for me, both times, from the first story yes. to the story mm -hmm. so. So uh, that, it seems to me, reading this one, more, even more so that that was kind of an expectation that the, if when you join them, the convent whatever, or whatever. The Carmelites was right. Uh, that you, you, you were affluent, you came in affluent, and you captured affluence, you, and you did not give it up. So that was um, certainly not what I was familiar with growing up and going to school. I was surprised by that. And it seemed like she settled into that for a short time. Yes. She, right. she, she did she enjoy it and appreciate it and then realized that that's not what was important to her or that it distracted her from her prayer. You know, it would be interesting to me to like see a spreadsheet of that time period. Mm -hmm. To see, was this order of men, were they affluent or were they not? Mm -hmm. And then all of the orders of sisters, you know, we're, we're reading about different groups of women, but they're, they're pretty much similar. Yes. And so I'm, I'm wondering, and you know more than I do, Therese, but um, did, when the women were making decisions to enter these communities, I know that we just said they entered because they were affluent and they thought, well, that's a lifestyle I'm used to, so I'll go into that community. Right. <laughs> or not. I don't know, because I, I, I just think we don't get a picture of the whole society right? and how they live. Exactly. And you hear some that were very austere. You know, you hear of the Franciscans and the Augustine of monks that, you know, lived very, you know, lived in, in the caves, you know, they went when they started their order. So. You're right, there probably is a whole range if we saw that spreadsheet. Uh, what were you going to ask? Uh, no, I was going to just say, when we talk about St. Francis, I mean, he was like, because he embraced poverty so completely, they thought he was crazy. Yeah. They, they really did, because it was just, even the more, more austere monasteries at the time were to the degree that Francis embraced with his order. Yes. I, I, I just the impression that's what I got the impression I got from reading about him. He just was that they thought he was crazy. So that life of complete poverty, the church hierarchy or the church didn't really think about it so much. It seems. Yes. And you know now the nuns, um, they unless they came from a really rich background. But then they maybe when you go into being a nun, they go in at such a young age and they know what they have to do, poverty and all that. So I think they're very more accepting now of that. Yes. Not that 
know, it challenged me that I thought, why should I be surprised that the nuns wanted to be comfortable? I, I am very comfortable. <laughs> there's, there's nothing austere about the room where I sleep. You know, I'm not on the floor or on a cot, and it's not cold every night. And we don't regularly eat bread and water, you know, that, so, I mean, I could see where if they were, you know, if the sisters were taking things away from others for their own comfort or that. But I thought how easy it is for me to say, she's a nun, she should be in this one room that kind of looks like a cell, and, you know, she should give up everything. But I don't put those same requirements on myself. Um, well, I don't you know why you're not. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, I, would that help me to pray more if my life was more austere? She seemed to feel that she needed to eliminate all those distractions. Well, I think um, she did that because she thought that it would, you would be a slave to it. I guess, and didn't you love that term, being a slave mm -hmm. to those in the world? Yes. I mean, uh, computer today, I can't oh tell you how it's like playing mm -hmm. stupid uh, yes. games and everything. And it's two hours later, you say, where did I go? <laughs> yes. you know I mean? And I think you have to be more thoughtful about um, prayer in the world we live in now. For, it, really, my whole life, I mean, in terms of it, it wasn't like you go to the convent and you go and you have prayer time and you have this time and, and this is what you do and in the world that we are in and I was always working um, and mothering and being a wife of everything then it makes a world of difference of what you how you can plan your time and how much time you do give to our Lord to Jesus yes. so I think it's I think it makes a lot of difference Right. You talk about right. Right. Yeah. yeah, I agree with that. And she mentions that about um, being distracted, you know. Yes. And that, you know, you have to focus on Jesus when you pray. You can't mm -hmm. have other things going on. Yeah. Focus on the cross. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's yes. right. Christ. And even, even now with the coronavirus, when it first started, somebody put on the internet, well, you're going to go to church in your pajamas on Easter. Oh, yeah. I got dressed. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but today, I'm in my pajamas. Yeah. I'm not yeah. I said oh, the same you thing. you go yeah. downhill mm -hmm. if you don't mm -hmm. continue. Yeah. Yeah. I said that about her the first who week. Who you're talking about. Yeah. yeah. That was strange. Yeah. Just what you said, Terry. Extremely strange. And then I got dressed, too, after a couple yeah. weeks. Yeah. Because it felt so weird mm -hmm. to sit in front of my computer. Not nice. Janice and Beth. Yeah. yeah. Weird. See, that doesn't bother me. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 don't, I don't do it because, you know, but um, when I use the computer to stream the mass, I really kind of miss it now because I'm going physically. And during the pandemic, I didn't. Mm -hmm. I am so I really kind of miss it because I would get a little piece of bread and a little cup of wine, oh, yeah. and I would actually, you know, partake in the service. And I had I was all by myself, mm -hmm. so I had no one to distract right. me, and it was really lovely. It didn't matter what I wore; it was a matter of engaging. And so now, physically, I go, and then you hear babies cry, and then you know you think about, oh, gee, I, I got to get going here, you know, whatever. And so yeah, it's entirely different. You're right. Yeah, so I, I thought that period of time for me was very enlightening. And uh, I kind of miss it. Yes. Yeah. And I haven't gone to and streamed, you know, on to mass for a long time now. Yeah. Because I'm going personally. Uh, but I go on to another prayer group at, at Jesuit Retreat House once a month with Sister Mary Ann Flannery. And she happened to talk about Teresa at that Oh, home. really? Because uh -huh. she was the front runner of reorganizing the Carmelites. Mm -hmm. And she called her the strength of that order. Wow. And, and a saint from that order. And uh, she was the one that organized them and was able to, uh, to 
bring them to a different level. And I thought, I thought that was interesting. I said, oh yeah, I just read that story. <laughs> well, the strength of the Carmelite. What? Yeah, she's the strength of the Carmelite. Yes, I love that title. Yeah. And that was very difficult for her. Um, tell me, were you surprised, I learned so many things in this. Were you surprised at that whole period of her life when they declared her as dead oh, yeah. and put yes. the shroud on her yes. and then her father said, oh, she's not dead? <laughs> yeah. I was, what a scenario <laughs> to go through. That was, you know, that the extent of her illness and to go through that, and, um, we talk about a near-death experience, but she had never died. She was, but yet they were all, in, in that time, they were declaring her as dead and ready to prepare her for burial. Right. Um, what a profound experience to come back from that. And I, I had never heard that about I'm her. struck life. by that too. And also Teresa Lazou had some tremendous yes. health issues. St. Ignatius, um, Loyola. Um, and you wonder how much of that was instrumental in helping them become more spiritual. And you wonder how maybe if we're subject to uh, problems like that, it can, rather than fight it, accept it, and learn from it, and become more spiritual through illness. Yes. So, um, it seems to be a lot of that. Exactly. I think that's definitely a lesson to take away yeah. from that. Um, not that I want anyone to think that I'm bad when I'm not. <laughs> um, that was uh, very profound, but I was surprised by that in her life story. I also, on the very first page of this chapter, page 24, she talked about how close she was to her brother. Like Teresa Rousseau, her mother died at a mm -hmm. young mm -hmm. age. Yeah. And she said, the young pair frequently collaborated on secret plans whose innocent designs often revolved around experiencing the glories of martyrdom. Wow, as children, to talk about the glories of martyrdom. I mean, that, that was she was a child of grace and vision at a very young age. That would, um, I, just some of her um, thoughts and habits were amazing in her. And the author spent a lot of time on her life story, on her growing up, mm -hmm. and um, to find, um, a focus on um, her moving away from vanity, um, dependence on others, you know, all of those um, outward signs that she was um, committed to at one point. But then they emphasized um, humility. And she said the importance of humility. Anybody think about that? They talked about then and humility being the absence of pride as well. That might have been a result of her growth getting closer to Jesus because she's depending on him more than anything here. So in the world, if, if she's going to get acclimates because she did something good, she didn't want to reflect on that as much as give thanks to God for letting her do that, using her as an instrument. I've read a number of different authors and thought about humility many times. Uh, maybe God keeps putting that on my mind. <laughs> um, I think that your definition is one of the best. That humility is complete dependence on God or a relationship with Jesus. I think she recognized her limitations through humility too, if I remember. Yes. I was touched by the part where she she re reflects on her relationship with God as a marriage. Yeah, okay. she talks about I'm married to God, yeah. right. and uh, you know that just struck me because marriage is a special uh, relationship. You know, yes, and it's intimate, and it's two people as one. And so uh, that really uh, impressed me the most, uh, that uh, analogy of, of a marriage and being married to God. 
and giving your soul to that person. She had a real depth in what she said, everything she took to, I think it's truest meaning, like her description of marriage and um, relationships and intimacy with Jesus, as you said. I like the verbs that she used um, in relationship to a husband. A good wife knows her husband, understands, cares, and is attentive. And that just powerful statements. You're right. She she didn't take anything lightly. As you said, it was powerful statements. Significant uh, verbs in her language. It was interesting. She said she didn't even want to be a writer. That it was her spiritual director who told her to write a book. Um, and and the, her life story. She didn't really want to enter the convent. She just decided to do it. <laughs> just it seemed like she just said, "Well, God wants me to do this." Or, it wasn't this lifelong ambition that we heard in some of the other Teresas. Mm -hmm. um, but she just said, well, I'll, all of a sudden it's just, well, I'll enter the convent. And uh, I thought it was very interesting how she made her decisions. Um, the other one, I learned a new word on page 29 when she said she began the work of founding the reform branch of the Carmelite order, mm -hmm. the Discalced. I don't even know if I'm saying that correctly. Um, Discalced, which means shoeless indicates the return to the austere roots of Carmelite life. And she called it the new convent of St. Joseph. Well, she was a little older than <coughs> the Teresa we talked about. Before. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. but she was older when she entered. Right. So, you know, the other Teresa went at 16 or 15 or whatever. <clears throat> Excuse me. So she hadn't matured as much as uh, this particular uh, Teresa, and uh, and as it said, that she you know saw things or was given the gift of God to reform what was there. Right. And so um, those times must have been very difficult. You know, it, when when you watch old movies and they have you know the costumes and all the things that you know and and how they ride horses and carriages and stuff, you know, and wear all those clothes. And, you know, I mean, it was such a different life and a different way of doing things. I mean, they didn't have phones and they didn't have um, automobiles. <laughs> you know? I mean, it was difficult to get around even. Uh, but <clears throat> I don't know, you know, maybe it was easier to go into being a nun and to raise six kids, like I think her father remarried and she had what, six brothers and sisters? I mean, I don't know, you know, it's an interesting concept. I noticed uh, when I was reading this chapter, I spent more time thinking about my older sister who entered the convent. Mm. She was an Ursuline nun. Uh, she's no longer living now, but um, I remember thinking, you know, when something would be brought up here, I think about it in the present, in her life as a religious. Yes. And um, I found it fascinating because. I don't think there was a great deal of um, poverty in the in that particular religious community. Um, but I remember the story that she told me about Mother Teresa, and Mother Teresa, when she died. She had a pair of glasses, a sweater, and a pair of shoes. That was the extent of items that she called her own. Wow. 
And I thought, ooh, well, maybe um, I don't have any experience in poverty either because, you know, I have closets full of clothes. Right. Um, and, and I say that because when you mentioned about I didn't have a car, I can remember when I was like in grade school, my mother would, they, the sisters would, at, at our local parish, would call my mom and say, oh Eileen, can you drive us to <laughs> this wake? We want to go to this wake. And, you know, and we had a station wake, so they loved it. Oh, <laughs> they call it often. <laughs> yeah, they did. <laughs> and, and they filled it up, you know, they got every the little body they needed to get into that station wagon to get to the weight. But, you know, that was their norm. Mm -hmm. And that became my mom's norm. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so, I, I guess what I'm trying to say, it was interesting to experience my mom's involvement with the community and then my sister's life in that community. Mm -hmm. That, um, and my sister at that time, well really all of her life, she was one that challenged everything. <clears throat> and she would say, no, nope, we don't need to do that. Nope, nope, that's not the best choice. And I'd be like, well, she's going to last about two weeks. <laughs> and they'll be sending her home. Yes. <laughs> well, she followed the models of the two Teresas we've read about so far. Mm -hmm. yeah. It was the same. Yeah. So. You know, every time Father Don mentions uh, getting, not being attached to things, you know, in his sermons and stuff, makes you want to go home and get rid of everything. You know, like, yeah. you know, like everything that I've ever bought that I really didn't need. You know, it's like, well, maybe you're supposed to do that. I don't know. Well, I thought the trees of Emma pointed out well that the difference is, is are we a slave to mm -hmm. those items? Yes. Like, yes. Does, does those take priority? Like, what would we do to save those things? Yeah. Would we, you know, give up something in our relationship with Jesus or other persons? for the sake of those items, or the sake of computer time, or whatever it is that we have. And, and I think um, we need to look at that, because there's, there's a fine line we can sometimes slip over, that um, normally we're not a slave to those things, but it's a good reminder. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, for I think that she gave us that, where we need to be rooted, and hers is certainly in a very deep prayer and relationship with Jesus was, was where she was rooted. Um, I also thought she spent a lot of time, of course, her writing in that, is talking about the soul. Mm -hmm. and that was another thing that well, I haven't spent a lot of time thinking about my soul. You know, and she, on page 34, she described it. I began to think of the soul as if it were a castle made of a single diamond of a very clear crystal in which there are many rooms, just as in heaven there are many mansions. Now if we think carefully over this, sisters, the soul of the righteous man is nothing but a paradise in which, as God tells us, he takes his delight. In the center in the midst of them all is the cheapest mansion where the most secret things pass between God and the soul. If this castle is the soul, then there can clearly be no question of our entering it, for we ourselves are the castle. Wow, I spent a lot of time thinking about that. Uh, and I don't think too much about when I die, it's my soul that's going up to heaven, not my body. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> but doesn't it say somewhere else that the soul is the same as the self? Yes. That our, that, that's who we are, is our it's soul. Yeah. 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 I needed to think more about that. 
I said, this analogy encourages us to recognize our soul as something beautiful, as a place where God takes delight. He loves us enough to want to dwell in the depths of our being. He desires to be as close to us as we are to ourselves. Well, that's love, isn't it? I mean, isn't love something you can't say is, you know, visible? So the soul is something that is not visible, really. I mean, if you look at a, a you know, a gram, a mammogram or anything, you know, on your body, yes. where's the soul? You know, it's, it's not there. So it's it's within. Um, the mind. I would think more of the mind. Yeah. Um, and love, you know, that's what love is. Love is giving willingly. It's a feeling, it's an emotion, it's, it's something that that we give to another and share with another. So getting back to the marriage idea, you know, understanding and, and uh, sharing that special moment. And I thought she uses those, I don't want to say interchangeably, but consistently, like the soul, um, relationship with Jesus, love, um, the depth of prayer. Um, those were kind of all aligned for her, it seemed to me, that when she moved away from talking about the soul, she was talking about her relationship with Jesus. When she moved on from that, she was talking about love, that it was based on love, and she went into the marriage analogy. And then she talked about her prayer, that how she needed to get to a level of real depth of that prayer, so that it was a relationship with Jesus. She talked about saying Hail Marys and Our Fathers, and just saying them too quickly without thinking, mm -hmm. that she needed to move into a greater depth of her prayer. So. Um, all of those different images were helpful to me, but um, I never really thought about this castle piece mm -hmm. of the soul. What puzzles me is something I really can't imagine. Maybe I don't pray well enough. <laughs> but this um, transport of ex to ecstasy for her and Is that what contemplative prayer does? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I don't. And I don't say think I have that. I, but I think what you're saying. I know the difference. I can now tell the difference, and especially reading this book and about the priest, the difference of, of my prayer and my <clears throat> conversations with God in the past to where I am now. And I think that's a piece of what we were talking about too, that, it, that your life is such that you do have, well, I shouldn't say you should, but it, it seems to me that I do better now than I did in the past. And like you say about the Hail Marys and the Our Fathers, to me that's a perfect example. I'm talking too fast and saying it's a prayer, but is it a real, is it really a prayer? So, well, I, I think you're, you're really talking to God as opposed yeah. to repeating Reciting words. Reciting words, yes. exactly. So yeah. you're talking That's to God, and yeah. then you have the <laughs> silence where you wait for God to talk to you. Right. And uh, so and you don't need to speak. I mean, you, right. you don't speak. Yeah. You know, you're, you're quiet. You're here and yeah. with God you know, in a different way. And so that's where you would reach ecstasy, I suppose, because I don't think when God speaks to you, you. <laughs> right. but you know, I'm no. just saying it's a different, it's a relationship as it opposed is. to a resuscitation of prayer or whatever. And I think it's where you are in your life. Mm -hmm. You can see that's, 
that's to me been a great piece of where I started and married and had children and worked. And then little by little they grew up and they each one left the house and then you know, we had marriages and, you know, and it, there, your life itself just takes you to such different levels. Yeah. And that's where I think my levels with God changed as I as I as my life changed. I think that been what I I was lucky if I could say a prayer on my way to work in the night. Yeah. Many moons ago. <laughs> and I think there's yeah, but you were still in I, your vocation that God right. called you to. And, and oh, that's yes. what He wanted you to do. Exactly. He, he, he plans out your life. He knows what you're going to do with him before you do. Right. So you're giving glory to God just by being a mother and, and going to work. And going and to work. And <laughs> Pieces and parts. You've raised how many kids? And now you got grandkids. Now yeah. you're the most so. popular in the world. Yeah. So, you know. So. <laughs> that's right. And I think, too, they need to remember that the Hail Mary's, the Our Father, those can be very real and sincere prayers. Yes. It's how we pray them yes. and do them. Because I um, I love praying the rosary and saying the Our Father and you know, being attentive to that. But I also will be honest, when I wake up during the night and can't fall asleep, I will pray the rosary. And it's pretty rote. It's kind of like counting sheep, but saying Hail Mary's instead. It's mm -hmm. one step above. Um, there's not a lot of thought or prayer in that. It's just saying, this is something that brings, brings me great comfort and peace. So if it's three in the morning and I pray in the rosary, it's very different yeah. than mm -hmm. if I come to church or if I pray on. So there's a difference in how, and even contemplative prayer. There are times when I say, I need to be contemplative now. So I should be contemplative for 10 minutes. And then my mind wanders, mm -hmm. and I thought, oh, I can it's make hard. it again. Mm -hmm. you know that? Mm -hmm. So I um, think Therese talks about a lot of really developing that very fervent and real prayer that only comes with the relationship with Jesus. Mm -hmm. That um, the focus is then is on the relationship, not the words or the time that goes on. You know, when I think of ecstasy in prayer, I'm reminded of a woman that was an Ursuline nun, and she was an artist. Oh. And they, and now that I've read a little more about it and went to see the exhibit on the French artist. Oh, oh yes. He's not French. No, the Van Gogh is that? Yes. Uh -huh. yes. Uh -huh. But they say that sometimes artists, in their creating their work, have achieved a level of ecstasy. And, and their work comes out of that, which makes sense to me. Yes. Now, there is one person that I know of, and I'm not going to say the person's name. She. <laughs> she would be unhappy with me. <laughs> but um, this person's, I believe, able in her prayer life to get to a point where she is totally unaware of her surroundings. And I, I, as a science background, I have trouble with that. I'm like, oh, really? <laughs> but yes, really, this happens. Um, and I think, instead of being curious and instead of saying, I, I need to work on that, I, I stay back and just say, oh, I don't know. I'm like, Mary, why are you resisting it? Yeah. Why aren't you working towards it? Right. Do you hear what I'm trying to say, the difference? Mm -hmm. um, and I think, Mary, that reminds me of something that 
was told about Teresa of Avila here, that she said it was giving up your will to God was part of her prayer. And I'm wondering, as I think about that, I'm wondering if I would be afraid to give up that much control to get the, to that level of prayer. What does that mean? That I'm not aware of anything else, everything that's familiar and comfortable to me in that process is not there. So I'm wondering if that's completely giving up my will to surrender to God's will, which what Teresa of Avila talked about in her prayer. Um, complete surrender to God's will. And in that moment of prayer and ecstasy of being unaware. And I wonder if that might be my resistance. As you said, you know, why don't we enter that? My answer might be, I wonder if it's I haven't been able to completely surrender to God. I think that's about three. Kevin, Kevin is yeah, talk about three levels of spirituality, and Teresa of Avila seemed to go through all of them. Um, I'm going to obey all the rules, that's the first one, so because I fear out of fear. Right, she talked about yeah. that. Yeah. And then well. the second level, which I think most people strive for, is that relationship with Jesus. And you kind of you can grow in that relationship. But the third level is the hardest to reach because it means here's a blank check. I give everything. I surrender everything. And understanding that the surrender will bring suffering because the, the way of the cross. And that's a hard thing, I think. Most people don't want to do that. that there's a resistance. Mm -hmm. and, and until we overcome that resistance, if I know um, I was talking to uh, a sister and I was saying, you know, I don't know if I want to go to that. I mean, that, thinks, that just seems too hard or too, you know, we like control of our lives. Yes. And to surrender that is, is grace, is special grace. And it's the acceptance of that special grace. I, I don't know. I just, I thought that was kind of interesting to see her move through all of Right. Things. And she does talk about grace through all of this, too. <laughs> um, relying on God's grace for that process. <clears throat> But here again, is it easier for her, being a nun, not having children, <clears throat> not having all these things that, that demand uh, your time mm -hmm. and your help and your love and so forth? Uh, you know, when you devote yourself to being a nun, then you eliminate a lot of that. And it's so it's, true. We, it's very hard for us, I think, or for me, uh, because there's so many things that require my need, okay? I mean, my sister right now is very ill, and so I have to go see her and hold her hand, okay? So I have to do this. So then, you know, my daughter calls, you know, this accident happened, you know, we've got to take care of this. So we have a lot of things that pull us away Whereas when you're in a cloistered place, as she was, you don't really have that. Certainly you have a daily, you know, if you're superior of an uh, order, you have to do all that. But I mean, you have less responsibilities to others. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Totally agree with, with what you said. But let's take another spin on that. I'm just coming from my angle. Um, as Christian women, we're women of service. Mm -hmm. And I think anything we do is a prayerful moment. Mm -hmm. So holding your, even though you don't think that, okay, I'm, I'm spending time with my sister and holding her hand, that is a prayerful moment. Mm -hmm. Or helping other people. Those are all prayerful, prayerful moments. And I'm hearing a little, um, I'm not at this level. Well, we all, I think we need to strive for that ecstasy moment in our prayer time. I think we need to pray unceasingly in all we do, in everything we do, and, you know, and, and leave the growth to, 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 to God. God. To God. Exactly. exactly. Okay. So, um, so that's where I'm coming from on this. I think, I think we're trying to measure. I, I will speak. I have one. I feel an ecstasy moment of prayer. I didn't plan it. Didn't think about it. Didn't, you know. I'll never, I'll never forget. It was about 12 or 13 years ago. We were, um, my husband and I were in uh, North Carolina, Hillnet or somewhere, some beachy area. 
and I was out in the water, and there were waves, and I just stood there and jumped, and I jumped, and I jumped like a little five or six year old. And my husband was anxious to leave, he was on the beach, get a little bored, he kept waving, come on, come on, we gotta go. <laughs> and I got back in, finally, after a long period of time, and he said, what were you doing out there? I said, I was praying that whole time. I was just surrounded by waves and, and sunshine and warmth. And I didn't think of that at that time. But now that you mention that, that when you're totally <laughs> eliminate all the distractions. <clears throat> yeah. And did I strive for that? No. And I think if we just kind of let go and let God, yeah. I don't mean to be preaching, I'm just, you know, <laughs> saying what's on my heart. I'm saying what's on my heart. But I just think sometimes we have these moments that we don't have to strive for, it just kind of happens in our lives. You know, and I think, I'm really glad you brought that up, Mary, because I agree. But tell me, do you think that's what, Sis, what Teresa of Avila wanted us to walk away with? That prayer is service. We are praying constantly. Everything we do, mm -hmm. um, we're all at different levels of prayer. Do you think that was her message? Tell me more, Mary, because I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so because <clears throat> she really didn't speak about acts of charity, mm -hmm. um, serving others, being aware of the needs of others. She really was talking about one-on-one -on -one prayer mm -hmm. with Jesus. Jesus. Mm -hmm. That's true. And that we we have to work on recognizing that that does exist and how do we make that exist in our lives? That was my thought too. The fact mm -hmm. that Mary brought that balance, certainly St. Teresa had a, a beautiful life and a beautiful relationship and gives us a wonderful model for prayer. But I, I like that we need we need to think broader, right? I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it's different for everyone, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and there's things we need to learn here. And this may be a model for any one of us, but the models that Mary Ellen and Mary just mentioned may be the ones that work for us as well. Are you ready to add to that, Teresa? I think prayer can, can, you know, can support what we do. So our prayer life and that concept Teresa of Avila responding to that relationship and growing. She obviously grew in faith. And we're called to do the same thing, to have that personal relationship with Jesus, because it, that's what helps helps each one of us in our own individual locations do the things that we need to do. To, some of us are called you know, to be contemplatives, but right now all of us are called to be contemplatives. And some of us are called to be wives and mothers and or employees, or employers, or whatever. But we're called, you know, whatever we need to do. I think prayer can can underscore and, and be the foundation of helping us do those well and make our service an act of prayer as well. Exactly. Which is Mary's thought. Mm -hmm. um, she's Babel gives us a lot to think about with this. On page thirty six. She said, um, the author says, we have the advantage of learning from Teresa's wisdom and experience. As we seek to love God with our whole soul, she teaches us the importance of three things. One, overcoming sin. Mm -hmm. Two, developing virtue. <clears throat> and three, offering our entire will to God. I thought it was interesting that they broke it down to three steps. Um, and they talked about how overcoming sin, that at, the, at first she gave up sin because she didn't want to go to hell. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that was, and that she avoided sin because of her relationship with Jesus, that she would not do anything to interfere with that relationship. Um, and then talk about developing virtue. I just liked that concept, developing virtue. That's a great focus to say. Um, it wasn't enough to just avoid sin, but there's another step after that. Yeah, cultivate goodness. Mm -hmm. 
Isn't that another, that who, Mary, I think, pointed out the verbs. Don't you like that? Cultivating mm -hmm. goodness. Mm -hmm. That's a great term. And the, just the opening sentence in that part, uniting our souls to God. That's just powerful. And then in that she talks about developing detachment the freedom from worth, earthly things. Um, and at the bottom of page 38, again, I loved her terminology here. Um, Teresa referred to her love of Jesus as heavenly madness. Mm -hmm. Now see, I've had trouble with that. Mm -hmm. I, I just... I like that her discussion of detachment and um, even the thought of, you know, not being a slave to pomp and circumstance. But boy, when she backed down to heavenly madness, I'm like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> really? Because. What is the word you don't like? Is it heavenly or the madness? Madness. <laughs> 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 madness. I think it was madness. You can say madness is a good thing in the, in the concept of that love for God. I mean, See, when you're in love, you're, you're mad. I mean, people call you mad sometimes. Because you don't see flaws, you don't see, you understand. <clears throat> so, so madness is is strength and, and depth to me, heavenly depth. Yeah. See, that says to me, and Diane mentioned this, a loss of control. I'm like, don't mess with my mind. <laughs> um, well, I have to keep control of that. And did she study theology? I don't know what she studied. They didn't say. See, sometimes I think we, we hear a section of their lives. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I think it's intriguing. And, but I'm like, well, let's talk about how she got here. And how... She was sick a lot too, so maybe she was. She was sick, sick a lot. lot. Sick. Oh, she yes. was at boarding school, and then she had to come home to right. her dad for a while. Yes. And it was like two years or something. Right. Like they were telling the amount of years after each thing, and then when she stopped yeah. dead, right, and, and, you know, came back to life, mm -hmm. whatever you want to say. That it took her think, three or four years. Mm -hmm. Yes, three that's years right. Her recovery period so, was you lengthy. So you know, laying in bed. Well, well anybody, anybody, but right. you're going to think about it, you know, she, she had some inner things going on, I'm sure. 
Well, I wonder if anybody's read her book, The Interior Castle. Would we know more mm -hmm. if we did that? Or is it readable? Because uh, she wrote it in the 1500s. Mm -hmm. Did you find yeah, it online too? Yeah. Sure. Sure. <laughs> I tried to find it online. Uh -huh. But what I did find is from Porter Library, but it's been requested. I couldn't even get, the, get it because other people are trying. There is an audio version, not of the book, but of a person working through okay. the stages of prayer. Oh. And the Porter Library had that, and I, like I said, I have a hold on that. Mm -hmm. So you Googled Interior Castle? And I, I went to well, the library website. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, Interior Castle, and that oh. audio came up. Because if you think about it, that wouldn't even be in, I mean, back in the 1500s. Yeah. yeah. When was the printing press even? <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, that's where my mind was going, yeah, exactly. because I was reading this. What were things like? Yes. But she works through those rooms. There's seven rooms oh, of prayer. Okay. So I could do a little audio listen. I can just give you feedback. Exactly. Since we won't finish until February, yeah. because we'll meet in January and February. So maybe by then, mm -hmm. you'll be on the list that um, mm -hmm. you'll have the audio mm -hmm. to hear that. But Mary, you're right. But she must have had some training, or maybe it was just the depth of her experience, because she is one of the doctors of the church. Remember, there's only 31 total from the beginning of the church until now. So she, her work was recognized at that level. So um, I'm not sure we, we, of her background, but someone in the hierarchy of the church was impressed with her writing. And talking, I, I love what you said about knowing the timeline or the period or what's mm -hmm. going on. I mean, were there even, we think of schools of religion, we think of theology and studies. Was that even an option? Probably not. We not for women, for women, I don't no, know. Yeah. I think so, right? Yeah. <clears throat> well, she was elite, though, so that she had maybe some private. She might have more availability yeah. because of right. her wealth right. mm -hmm. and her background. You know, I told myself that I would read up on the doctors of the church. Like, what does one have to do to be a doctor of the church? And guess what? I didn't get to that. <laughs> <laughs> I think we need to do that. I would do that. Um, I did a very brief research of that, and it found out that there were 31, and it was on the base of scholarship. Scholarship. More than prayer, it's scholarship that uh -huh. you know, you're writing what you produced. And which is, it shows your intelligence. Yes, so right. it's and the depth of understanding of mm -hmm. theology. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. So some of the most prayerful saints may, may not, not be scholars. Mother Teresa may not be a doctor of the church ever, right? Because right. that was not her focus. You know, if we believe that all things are possible with God, and she was that close in her relationship with Jesus, his input to help her write, she didn't right. want to write that book. Mm -hmm. Yes, right. <clears throat> so she's getting information through mm -hmm. hoping yeah, to get out of that. Right. Yes. And I'm sure and you're I right think, there. And I think because she had that relationship with God, that she was able to accomplish everything that she did, even though she wasn't a mom and and you're right, right. And right. That she wasn't that. I don't think it had. Yeah. So you do pray more when you're a nun, I suppose. But she had her vocation mm -hmm. that God gave her, right. and He's directing her, especially if she's that close to Him, right, to do all these things that she accomplished. And they weren't easy. Right. Oh, they were no. not easy. You know, I I feel like I want to share this. Because, but here's my memory problem. What's the name of the Catholic Church in May? Yeah. St. Rayfields. Rayfields. Rayfields has a hallway where there's a picture of all of the doctors of the church. Really? Oh, wow. And I thought, <coughs> we should go on a field trip. <laughs> <laughs> And go over and see because they're nice images. You know, they're not like old and ugly. <laughs> they're they're so rather contemporary yeah. looking. Yeah. And I think you get a sense of what this person looked like. And that's interesting.
interesting. I wonder what motivated a person at St. Raphael's to dedicate a hallway to the doctors of the church. When all of the saints and holy men and women we could have selected, I wonder why their focus, not that it's bad, but I think it's interesting that they chose the doctors yes. of the church. Well, we're learning the higher, opportunity. What's the hierarchy? I mean, is a doctor of the church considered higher? Well, these women are saints and doctors. But that's a good question. Are all 31 doctors of the church also saints? Oh, oh that's a good question. Oh. Yeah. Probably not, I because the doctor would question. be, you know, yeah. that would be a, a, like an academic yes. you know, kind the of thing. Because St. Teresa of Nassau and St. Teresa of Avila are both doctors of mm -hmm. the church. So I didn't know what Sue was. Yes. Okay, well, when you do your research, <laughs> well, we're going to be busy, right? Mary Ellen's going to teach us about the doctors of the church. Yeah, Mary's going to listen to the audio of the interior of the song. Yes, before. <laughs> That's right. This group is getting real going. Keep your first Thursdays of the month open. We have a lot to do. Um, on page 30, 41, sorry, her third step was offering her will to God. And she talked about surrendering um, the will to God was essential to have union with God. And at the bottom of the second paragraph, she said, it's much more fruitful to humbly accept what is happening, trusting that God knows what he's doing, even if we don't. And I thought, I read this carefully, and I, could took, I took it two ways. Um, I thought, trusting that God knows what he's doing, even if we don't, meaning, I don't know what I'm doing, or I don't understand what God's doing. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think I've been in both places, mm -hmm. that sometimes I'm not sure why I'm doing what I'm doing. I don't understand why. The sentence above that is telling me also, um, when troubles arise, we fight, yeah. because we presume we know more than he does, which is the same as saying, I don't understand yeah. what you're doing. So that I imagine that goes for uh, illness and and death, and we just have to accept it. And I think it's even maybe accept it or try to pray and think about the why or God's role, God's plan. I think about that a lot with the pandemic that we're in right now. But God is allowing this, right? That. It's happening, and when you think about, um, you know, large global issues like the pandemic, down to the shootings at the high school in Michigan. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I keep, God knows what He's doing, even if we don't. Yeah. I don't. I think that's a major issue that you don't recognize. I have had that happen in my lifetime. That um, I'm here because God wants me to be here because of issues that I've had with my health and my over the last 30 years. And um, I made a comment to my daughter one time within the last couple of years because I don't even know why it came up, but it did. And I said, I don't understand why I'm still here. And I guess, guess I wasn't having a good day. <laughs> but, 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 it was, but it was so typical, but you know, sometimes children, and this is adult children, very adults. You know, um, and she said to me, you don't understand, Mom. You're here because God has a job for you. Mm -hmm. So until your job's over, you're here. You're stuck with all of us. <laughs> and I thought, I hate to say it, but I think that's really very, very, very true. And, and because I should not be here phys physically, and I am. And so I have to, I have to buy into that statement because I think it's true. Because that's the only reason I'm here. Well, that's the thing about prayer, you know, you can pray and you know, it's only going to turn out the way God wants it to end. Exactly. So, I mean... So, why pray? So, no, no. No, I believe in prayer and I pray every night, you know, but I just pray normally, say, yeah. Our Father, Hail Mary, and talk to Him and that's it, you know, and whatever you want is fine with me. You know, no, that's no, no, no I, I say, yeah. why aren't you doing this? Yeah. <laughs>
I've asked and asked and asked. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, oh, that's yeah. true. I've done that. Yeah. 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 You don't get it. So, you know. Yeah. No, I mean, it's like I just recently prayed for two different people, you know, for a number of months. They were ill. And they went to heaven. Oh, they went to heaven? I'm saying. <laughs> I hope so. It's kind of like, it's kinda like you, there's no sense in saying, you know, hope to, that they get well or whatever because it's going to happen the way God wants it. Yeah. That's yeah. it. No, that's true. But, but that's just my take. Well, that's the surrender that Teresa's talking about. Right. That we may not understand it, but we need to surrender mm -hmm. yeah. to God's plan. Before we finish for today, I want to look on page 44. They always give us ways to be more like the saints. And on page 44, we have 10 ways to be more like St. Therese of Avila. Um, meditate on a passage from the Gospel. Keep silent when you are falsely accused, unless it would cause scandal. Um, I refer to that as getting thrown under the bus. <laughs> <laughs> and just stay there. Oh, I love that. Um, meet regularly with a good spiritual director. I know for some persons that's been a very positive. I put a big question mark on that. How do you find one? And out of my understanding, you pay that big buck. Um, if you meet with one. Mary Ellen, do you want to talk about that? Because we do have some women in our parish who... Um, serve as spiritual directors? There is um, some educational preparation to do this. Right. Um, you do offer a um, stipend. Mm -hmm. yeah. A stipend. stipend and offering. Uh, yes. But big bucks, I have never oh. heard that phrase used for that relationship. Okay. It just um, seems, you know, like it doesn't fit, you know, paying mm -hmm. you to be my spiritual director. Is, no, no, it doesn't. Like there's some, yeah. <laughs> and on a formal level, it is offered at the Jesuit Retreat House mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in Parma. They okay. do have a number of spiritual directors okay. there. So if you were interested in that, and mostly, I believe most of them do follow the Ignatian mm -hmm. model mm -hmm. of prayer mm -hmm. and spirituality. Yeah, John Carroll has the program. Yes, they are training some Yes, and we do have two women here at the parish. Yeah, so mm -hmm. if you were interested, okay, we could put you in touch with them as well. Mm -hmm. And one's older and one's younger. Oh, <laughs> great. <laughs> so I like that. That mm -hmm. is good. For the, you know, parish. Right. Yes. Yeah. That's good to hear. I wasn't aware that we have a younger person mm -hmm. always. Good to see young people moving into these roles. Um, number four was ask God to reveal how you can use your gifts to serve the church. Do acts of penance, even outside of Lent. How about this? Examine your conscience whenever you glance in a mirror. I think of my conscience when I look in the mirror. This is this is a good point for me. Like, Another opportunity for prayer, right? When we think of stopping points in our day to bring us back to God in prayer. I bet looking in a mirror, that's a good point. Participate in a program that helps form young people in their faith. Go to confession monthly. Redirect gossip by publicly giving the benefit of the doubt to the victim. Sainteries talked a lot about gossip, right? How she, mm -hmm. in her young years, that that made her feel more accepted and more important by gossip. She um, gave some good examples of um, gospel gossip as sin and avoiding that. And then attend daily mass more often than you go shopping. I think that's <laughs> very, yeah, I like was that. Wasn't that a good direction? <laughs> that we, um, yes, it is. Ah. I mean, at the very days when I, many days, I go to the grocery store or anywhere else that I haven't been to Mass. Mm -hmm. But this is a good reminder. Mm -hmm. You go to daily Mass, right? Because I don't think the grocery shopping counts. Yeah. 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 Well, that's right. When we are a household yes. cook. Mm -hmm. That's right. Then that way. I get a pass on the grocery shopping. means to me 
grocery. Oh, I'm out and I'm just having a marvelous yeah. time, whether I buy anything or not. Right. And I, I even think it was leisure time activity once yeah. in my life, but I try not to do that. But if you see me at church all the time, you know I spend too much money. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> It's part of that repentance, right? Yeah. 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 I have so much respect for these people, the same people that come to church every morning. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, it's hard to sometimes get going, you know, but they do it. Exactly. It's wonderful time. to see that. And it's wonderful to be here mm -hmm. for daily mass. It is. It, and you wonder why you don't come more often when you do go. It makes you feel so good. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. a very it's, important it's, point. You're right. You see it. At the Eucharist and receiving Jesus. You're right. Yeah. What a gift. Uh, it does, it does make you feel good. I, I woke up, I set an alarm where I would never get up. And <laughs> I set it for this morning. And then I, of course, fell asleep. And, and 10 minutes later, I woke up and I went, get out of bed. <laughs> get dressed and get to bed. And I was late. And I, but, you know, just, yeah. and otherwise, I would have said, oh, I'm going to be late, so I'm not going to go. Yeah. But I was I was better today than I normally. Mm -hmm. Normally I would have just went right back to sleep. I know. I admit. Yeah. <laughs> well, we have a very sad thing occurring in the Catholic Church. I, I live very close to St. Luke's Parish, and so I go oh. there daily because I can walk. You know, yeah. Sometimes if the weather's good. No mass on Wednesdays anymore. No priests. Oh. No priests. Oh, yeah. oh, oh, that it's is the, the pastor. That is a problem. It's the pastor's day off. Cannot find a priest, mm -hmm. and when the pastor does his pilgrimages, which he just got back from um, in Lafayette and Italy, oh. um, we had a visiting priest whenever they showed up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. Wow. So there is a problem uh, in the church. Uh, we might not be able to go to daily mass. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. I think that's a reality. Mm -hmm. That is reality. Father. Yes. Well, Father's getting yeah, up there. Right. Mm -hmm. so we wonder and how. Our Father is five years younger yeah. than high, so he is turning 76. Yeah. Right. So he's extended. I know that yeah. because we uh, both grew up, grew up on the east side, and when he asked me where I went to school, and I said, Hope in Dominican, he told me that he went to a proud Hope in Dominican. I said, <laughs> <laughs> so I said, Oh, well, and then and he, I said to him, oh, but you didn't go when I went because I know you're younger than I am. So I was out of, uh, I was out of school before he could he's go to the prom. He went to St. Joseph's. Huh? He went to St. Joseph's. I know. Oh, I yeah. oh sure. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, so I when he goes to St. Joseph's, I also heard that. So I did. That's an extended year. He's in his father. But his father years. doesn't have a uh, helper either <laughs> since Father Joe died. You guys. Because Deacon told us that <coughs> Father does not take a day off because since Father Joe passed away, yeah. he has nobody to replace him on Thursday. Um, yeah. yeah. So I see that coming, and mm -hmm. I've even gone uh, to the daily mass, and the deacon came out and said whoever was covering didn't come. Mm -hmm. Right. Very, very sad. Yeah. So and you can, well, we can stream mass. So that's yeah, when yeah, you yeah. stream, you know. Yeah. But uh, so you, you know, that may be a sign that there'll be fewer daily masses mm -hmm. or more parishes closing. Mm -hmm. Well, I see numbers. If you if you listen to the monetary thing last day, we had um, 25 baptisms and 75 funerals. Mm -hmm. So you just look at those numbers, and right. you know there's not people coming up either to fill in the blanks. Yeah. 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 Thanks. Sorry. Let's, just, right, let's, pray. let's move to our intercessions at the Advent and move on because you are exactly right at that reality that we have much to pray for. And so we have our intercessions and um, Mary, can you just start with the first one and then we'll move around if everyone can read one of the intercessions and we'll read the response in the tab. We await your coming, and with joyful hearts we pray, 
come, oh Lord, Lord Jesus. Jesus. You come to bring us hope and courage. May, May we be people of hope and courage, courage in our world today. today. <clears throat> you come as a reflection of God's love. May our actions of justice and care reflect the same love. You come to show us ways of compassion and mercy. May we reach out to all people in our society with the same spirit of compassion and mercy. Oh, I'm very sorry. Oh, we await your coming with joyful hearts and pray. Come, Lord Jesus. Oh God, open our hearts to prepare the way for the coming of Christ. Guide us in your ways of compassion so that we may extend your love and mercy to all people. We ask this in the name of Jesus, for the eternal word. I apologize for that. Oh, that's um, true. And then, Mary, do you want to explain this? When Mary has Advent gifts for us. It, yeah, but this is the what well, this is those are okay, those are um, scriptures that I was with a group of women yesterday and these are all scriptures dealing with hope. And they pray the scriptures. You do not need to take it, but if it interests you, there's a one that you want to lock into. The first week of Advent is the candle of hope. So you made her uh, for Christ coming. But the one that I made and I thought I I had made this for another group and I had extra copies. This is a little prayer of uh, St. Teresa. It's a really beautiful prayer, and I had these last time I was going to pass them out, and I realized I had the wrong Teresa last week. <laughs> <laughs> the last month. So this is Thank her you. prayer that whoever wrote this ambitious, or not who, teams of people wrote this, this prayer is actually in our Catechism of the Catholic Church. This prayer is found in there. So that's how highly she is regarded. So you may take one of those as a bookmark or two or not. Um, these were from another group I worked with. Thank you so much, Mary. Okay. It's and a beautiful little prayer. Our next meeting is Thursday, January 5th, the first Thursday in January. We will talk about St. Teresa Benedicta of the Cross. So we will continue. Um, and we will still be within the Christmas season at that point. So I can say happy Advent. Um, a blessed Christmas, and we'll have the opportunity to continue our joyous celebration of Christmas at our next meeting. Thank you. What a wonderful discussion today. I appreciate it. Um, the songs are, are beautiful. I know Mary has scripture with us the scripture. Yeah, there's just a couple there that are just really, you know. I just love, I just love them. Okay. <laughs> the songs. Okay, gotcha. I mean, I love them. Right, right, right. There are so many beautiful. But these are all related to the word of hope, so that's what I. Oh, yeah. that's great. Yeah. yeah. I love this very thing. The theme. Oh, you're welcome. My favorite.